Statistics tell us that a large percentage of people pray. In fact, more people say they pray than say they believe in God. So you figure that one out. But our, our stance is this. If you're going to pray anyway, don't you want to do it right? Don't you want to pray correctly? And from our vantage point, praying correctly means praying in the way that Jesus taught us to pray. And so we've been walking through the Lord's Prayer and just breaking it down verse by verse and, and trying to glean some understanding from it. And so I want to do that with you today. Um, I'm going to read to you these verses from Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 through 13. And this is what it says. This is Jesus speaking. And he said, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so Jesus comes to the end of this prayer, and he has this one little place at the end of this prayer where he says, God, lead us not into temptation. And if I'm in the audience at that point, I got to tell you, my response is, well, duh. Like, I, I don't know about you. Maybe you're different than I am, but I don't need any I don't, I don't need God leading me into temptation. I don't need any help finding temptation. I am fully capable of finding temptation all on my own. However, this is interesting because, you know, you, you think about this truth that God never leads us into temptation. In fact, in James chapter 1, verse 13, it says this. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So I'm like, come on, Jesus. Do we, do we really need to ask God not to lead us into temptation? I would think that would be like the default. God is not, maybe we would have to ask God to lead us into temptation, but he doesn't do that. And so what is it exactly that Jesus is getting to at this point? And I think there are some things that I believe this prayer of Jesus teaches us that are really important. The first thing is this. When we pray this prayer, God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's an awareness that there is evil. It's an awareness that there is evil out there, and it's lurking, and it will hurt your life. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. In 1 Peter chapter 5, 8, Peter writes it this way. He says, be self-controlled, or some versions say sober-minded, be self-controlled and alert because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The scripture just makes it very clear that there is an evil one and he has a really devastating plan for your life. He wants to destroy your life. And so we need to live with a consistent awareness that there is evil. And when you pray that prayer, God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It just brings that awareness to your mind that there's an evil out there and it will destroy our lives. And I, I just want to say, and I hope you hear this in the right spirit today, but sin is nothing to play with. Sin will destroy your life. Sin is Satan's attempt to bring down your life, to bring destruction to your life. In fact, in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it says it this way, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The end result of sin is death. It's death to your soul. It's death to your spirit. And so Satan's desire is to destroy you. And when you pray this, it's an awareness that there's evil out there. Secondly, it's a recognition that you need help. You're not capable, and I want you to hear this today, you are not capable of standing up to the evil one on your own. It's not possible for you. It doesn't matter how strong you think you are or how strong you feel or how capable you, you, you feel about yourself or how confident you are in your ability to stand. When, when you feel that confidence, that is when you're most susceptible to fall. 
In fact, the scripture says it this way in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It tells us that when we are most sure that we are good, when we're most confident in our ability to stand, that is when we're most susceptible to fall. And so our prayer that Jesus is leading us to is this, God, I'm counting on you to deliver me. I, I know I can't do it on my own, so I'm counting on you to deliver me from evil. In fact, if, if I could just translate it for you and make it really simplify it and dumb it down, this is the Lord's prayer for dummies. It would just be help, God help. I need your help. I can't do it on my own. And so I'm counting on you to help me. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And that one phrase is so powerful and that God is faithful. We can count on God to be faithful to get us a way out, to provide a way out. You need his help. And the last thing that I think is important in this passage is that it reminds us that we need God's leadership. It's asking God for his leadership. When Jesus said to, um, that we're to pray, God, lead us not into, into temptation, we're not praying God don't lead us. We're acknowledging that we need his leadership. In fact, the best way to not fall in the midst of temptation is to avoid it altogether, is to just stay away from it. And to do that, we depend on God's leadership. How does God lead us? God leads us by his Holy Spirit that the scripture tells us every believer has, that as you walk through the course of life, if you pray and ask God, God, would you just speak to me by your Holy Spirit? I believe that God will do that. When your heart is right before him, when you say, God, I want your leadership in my life, I believe God will close down doors. He'll whisper things to you in your spirit by his Holy Spirit, and he'll lead you. And he also leads us by his word. He directs us through scripture that as you're reading God's word, he'll point out things that go, oh, this, this is a danger area. This is a place that you want to avoid. So I have a 10-year-old daughter and I've noticed recently that um, when we're in crowded places, like we'll be in a crowded mall, or at one point we were at Disney World together, and when there's crowd around and when there's chaos, oftentimes she will reach up and she'll just grab my hand. She doesn't say anything, she just reaches up and grabs my hand. Now, I, I have to tell you, I try not to make a big deal about this because I don't want her to stop doing it, but every time she does it, I smile. Every time she does it, there's something inside of me that just lights up because I understand what she's saying in that moment. She's not verbalizing it, but what she's saying is, man, there's chaos around here. I recognize there's danger around here. There are probably people that may not have my best interest. There are places I could go that would be dangerous for me. I could get separated and end up in a place that I don't want to be. And so, Dad, I need your leadership. I want your direction in my life. And I want you to know today that your heavenly father is the same way. He loves it when you reach up and grab his hand and just acknowledge, I need you, God, to lead me. In fact, one of the most, um, I believe the most beautiful passages in all of scripture comes from Psalm chapter 23. It's verses one through four. And this is David, the psalmist, writing this. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Do you hear that David speaking? Do you hear David speaking there and talking about his need for God's leadership in his life? And when you pray, God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, you're doing the same thing. You're seeking God's leadership. I hope this time as you've walked through this series with us has been helpful to you to understand a little deeper how God commands us to pray, how God wants us to pray. And I'm sure of this, that when you pray in accordance to God's will, God is faithful to answer those prayers. So we hope this time has been a blessing to you. God bless you.
We just heard from Pastor Paul McDill as he wrapped up the series and talked about the struggle of temptation and how God always provides a way out. We will now go to Pastor Rocky Hernandez as he leads this week's final discussion. We hope that this series has been a blessing to you and will stir conversation within your group. So let's go ahead and start. We're gonna we're gonna read, we're gonna go ahead and start with two verses. We're gonna start with Matthew chapter six, verse 13, and one person can read that. And then um, somebody else can read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. So go ahead and read the Matthew 6, 13, because that's where we are uh, in the series. Who's got it? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, so... Right there in the, in, in the middle of the Lord's Prayer is this idea of lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So let's go ahead and with that in mind, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So can anybody guess what the theme is tonight, what we're talking about? Temptation. And I love the first Corinthians. Um, the, the first Corinthians, I actually really love the way that it starts because it's talking about this confidence that you walk around with. Like you get to a certain point and you just think like, oh, these things that I don't, I don't struggle with these things anymore. Um, so just very vulnerably, very vulnerably right now, be honest. Is there like something that is so far out of your spectrum that you think you could never do? I would never murder a human being. Yeah. What would you murder? Because that was very specific. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think that, that that's true. Like it's easy to say, oh, I would never murder anybody. And, but then Jesus shows up on the scene and is like, well, if you get angry at somebody, you're literally murdering them. So, and I murdered a bunch of people today in traffic. So are there any other things that you feel are impossible for you? Like you don't think that this is going to be a struggle? I know why you don't want to answer because you feel like I'm setting you up. Because <laughs> you're going to be like, oh, I would never do this. And I would be like, well, scripture says you probably will. So, and I think that that's it. It's like there's this sense of confidence that if we're not careful, um, we can be so sure of ourselves that we get caught off guard. And so when, we, when we're in this, the Lord's Prayer, we're learning how to pray and, and how that affects the way that we live our lives. We're supposed to be praying like, and lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And then Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's saying like, don't ever get to the point to where you are so proud that you deceive yourselves because the second you are convinced that you're okay, you're gonna be tripped up. Why do we not think of sin as like constantly something that we have to be on guard against? I'm, I just don't think about it that way. Or, or could we ask ourselves, are we capable of every sin? Right? Is that a, is that a different question we could ask ourselves? Like, or remind ourselves daily of, and I am capable of murder, right? Or I am capable of fill in the blank, right? Is that a mindset that we should have? Yeah. No, and I think, I think that that's a good point because honestly, this is going to sound very direct. I apologize. Like you can email, not me, somebody else. <laughs> um, but nobody, when they're a little kid says, when I grow up, I hope I'm a crack addict. You know, nobody wants that. When, when we're dreaming, like we're not walking around dreaming about, oh, like, I hope I'm a murderer, or I hope, I hope, like when I get married, that I cheat on my wife seven times. Like, that's not the goal. And then life happens, and one day you find yourself in this situation that felt impossible. And then you start the negotiation process. And then before you know it, some time has passed, and you wake up, and you're like, when did this happen? How is this my life? And that's like the slippery slope of, of sin, isn't it? Have you ever surprised yourself in that? I think sometimes when I 
have to look back on, wow, that I, I actually just did that, that I, I find myself that we are, and I'm worried, are we so far gone as hedonists that we can't even recognize sin anymore um, yeah. in our own life? Um, and that's, that's in my darkest hours is when I've come to the realization that I'm so far gone from even recognizing that that was a sin in the moment or in the sustained time frame, and and I was away from my community or people that would call that out and speak that into me. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, in the lowest points of my prayer life, I've been just in the actual visibility of God was so far from me in, in my mind that it, I didn't even recognize that the sin pattern of what it was. Mm-hmm. So somebody read uh, the First Corinthians ten verse. 13, because actually I think it speaks a lot to what you just said, that question. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So, and I think that that very first sentence, why do you think it is important that we know, so much so that he would specifically say it, that there is no temptation that you face that is not common to all of us. Why is it important for us to know that? I don't know, for, for me, and I think someone else mentioned it, but when, <clears throat> when we were tempted before and we gave in, and um, like for me it was addiction, and God has brought me through that, I've gotten freedom through what he did on the cross, and it's, it's been a thing that a tool that I was able to use to help others through times in need. Yeah. Uh, if, if that answers the question. Um, no, but, I think that that's a solid answer. I wasn't thinking that, but you're absolutely right. Because when we struggle, our struggles are common to other people. And so like we talk about the fact that Christians have testimonies and that that helps us. So that's really a good thought. Echoing off that, the devil wants you to feel alone and wants you to feel isolated, and that's where your thoughts can spiral out of control. So like you were saying, if the more you can bring it to light, someone else has gone before you and someone else is coming behind you with the same struggle. So you can look and see what someone else has done and try what they've tried, obviously, Jesus, and then maybe you can help someone else. Also really good, because I totally wasn't thinking about the fact that that absolutely— The devil wants us to feel like when we're struggling that we're alone. Because if we believe for a second, man, isn't that the way that it works? Like we're too embarrassed to ask for the help that we need. And that is such a stumbling block to us, for sure. And literally when I asked that question, like my agenda in that moment, but your answers were so good. My agenda was that if we think that there is something that other people do, that we're beyond that, we are literally lying to ourselves because we are all capable of sin and not just random sins, every sin. We're literally just one bad decision away um, from ruining our lives and devastating everybody else's life in the process. One decision away. Um, But you're right, I, I I kinda wanna unpack this a little bit, because when we're like, lead us not into temptation, um, this idea of isolation, because I think it is a big hiccup in the church, because there are, man, there are some sins that are really acceptable in the church, and then others that really not so much. What are some things that you feel people are very comfortable talking about in the church, and what are, what are, yeah, let's talk about that first, because then I want to ask the other question, which is, what are people not willing to talk about in the church? So in college, personally, for me, like you always, a lot of us go to churches growing up where the pastors are like, oh, I was, you know, mad in line at the grocery store today, or I didn't yeah. pray fast enough. But like the first time that you hear a pastor or someone you really respect talk about like, oh man, like lust or porn or alcoholism yeah. or extreme anger or like, my wife and I almost got divorced. It's like, oh my gosh, like this person who I respect so much can go through that. Like, you know, these are things that I'm not alone with. And and even within our CGs, like these people that I have so much respect for, when I hear like, oh, they have the same struggles that I have, it's encouraging to me. And kind of like Brooke was saying, it takes you out of that shame spiral. It's kind of like, okay, like there are people that I can get through this with 
you know, there are people that I can fellowship with that'll help me out of this. And it kind of like encourages you, helps you out. And it also gives you a blueprint that you can follow too. You can kind of have people to go to and talk to about it. Can you tell me about a time when you were thankful that you shared, um, when you were scared to, to reach out for help and tell people what your temptations were and what you were struggling with and, and how it turned out positively? I don't know if this would fall under a sin struggle, but um, right after I had my son, I had really bad postpartum depression. And the thoughts that you have during that season are really, really dark. And you want to isolate and you don't want to reach out. And um, I started attending mops at Sea Life. And I remember telling some other mothers at my table what was going on. And they make me feel so normal. And um, it just lifted this burden off of me. And it, yeah. it was, I mean, it was so great to have that community just to open up to. I had a, a group of friends and we, we were doing a Bible study together. And right before we had our son um, leading up to fatherhood, I was trying to prepare myself to be a father. Um, and you kind of learn a lot about yourself and uh, you start to see a lot of your own flaws. Um, And so I just was able to lay those like fears and flaws down before the group of like, I feel selfish. I feel like I have so much to learn to be a father. Um, I I feel like I'm just not going to be good at it Um, and, and kind of lay all this stuff out. Um, And they were just able to encourage me like, Hey, quit being an idiot. Like the Lord has you where you're supposed to be. Um, Just live in the moment and, and trust that he will provide a way for you to be who you need to be for your son. I think that's really good. So, I want to talk more about like the promises that are here in this first Corinthians verse, because, you know, the Matthew verse tells us that we're supposed to be praying about not being led into temptation. And then the first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Go, somebody read that. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So it says right in the middle, literally right in the middle, that God is faithful. And how is God faithful? He provides a way of escape. Yeah. He gives us endurance, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like a praise hand, right? Like, yeah, thank you, God. Yeah. Right. Man, it's so tough. Like, because when you're in the middle of your temptation, it doesn't feel like you're strong enough, does it? Like, that's the lie, right? That's the thing that we believe is that, that we feel completely powerless. But there's, there's two, two promises there. The first is, one, you can do this. And then two, there's a way out. You can do this and there's a way out. And how do we know that? Because God is faithful. So, I mean, that's incredible. So I just want to give you just like an opportunity. When I say those things to you, like what is going through your mind? You're you're saying praise hands. Yeah, somebody else tell me. I think for me, I've lived on both sides of that. I've lived on, yeah, I know that, but why am I still struggling with this? Why am I failing with this? But to be on the other side of living in victory, it's it's even hard to explain because it's just like, knowing that, wow, God, like Jesus, what you did at the cross literally is empowering me to overcome this right now. And it's not me, it's your spirit inside of me. And I think when we get to this place of like self-righteousness, we set ourselves up to fail because it's like what God has saved is going to keep us going down this path of righteousness. So I just have to constantly live in the fact that Jesus, like just what you said, like I'm one step away from this, but thank God. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And so just knowing where I was and looking back and seeing where I am, it's like, this is possible. Like this victory, abundant life where we literally don't have to live with the chains of sin, it is possible. And so um, just living from that place of of victory, I think has radically changed my my walk. For sure. And I think testimony helps and remembering all the times that you've been victorious before, like You've been able to overcome it before. Uh, You'll be able to overcome it again. And I think like God is very good about helping us in our perspective of things. And when I'm reading these passages, perspective becomes uh, like a real thing because this Corinthians verse reminds me that I shouldn't be looking at the temptation. 
I should be looking for the way out. Man, and I don't ever do that. Like, it's hard. I'm not, and I'm just like sitting here, I'm getting goosebumps thinking like, man, I should, I should retrain my mind to when I am struggling to not be focusing on the temptation, but to look for the way out. That's incredible. That's incredible. How do you do that? I think what you were saying with looking at past victories, I think we've all have touched on that. But if you don't have a past victory, there's a whole lot in the Bible. Yeah. So you're praying to the same God that parted the seas. You're praying to the same God that made the sun stand still. You can tap into that God power there. Yeah, so for sure. If you can't think of anything, if you're stuck in that Satan escape room and you're trying to figure out the clues to get out, you can rely on the past evidence in the Bible too. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like also finding a way out, like may not necessarily be like in that moment because it might be too late, but it's like going to therapy, doing regen. If you have like a chronic sin in your life, it might be diving in and saying like, okay, what's behind this and preemptively getting tools or getting people around you accountability to where you're more prepared to fight that battle next time. Because I think if you wait until you're in the moment and you're like, oh, I can pull myself out of this pit you're probably setting yourself up for failure. So it might be just like preemptively fighting it, getting the tools in place, like learning what's the root cause of this sin that keeps happening. So fighting it outside of the moment as well. That's so good because I actually think like that at the beginning, there's no, there's no sin that befalls you that is not common to all man. And so like the first thing that we have to be willing to admit is like, oh, we struggle. Um, and there are things that we are exceptionally gifted in struggling more so than other people in. Like, I'm, I'm really good at justification of my own actions, and I know that doesn't always, and I'm better at it than most people. But, you know, Christ also says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so you have to, like, believe that truth. And so we're praying about our temptation. This is what Jesus, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And Jesus is like, well, let's start with the fact that you know the things that you struggle with. Let's start there. Let's start by, by owning that and being honest and then not feeling bad about it because it's not just you. We, we all struggle with something. Like, I believe that I could probably call any person in this room right now and say, man, I'm really struggling. I, I just need you to distract me or I need you to pray for me or I need, I need your help. Um, do you know who those people in your life are? How do you know? I know that that's a ridiculous question. How do you know that you can trust them? Most importantly, that they're going to tell me the thing that I don't want to hear yeah. first. And they don't affirm me in my sin or in my justification of how I'm feeling. It's not just an affirmation all day. Yeah. Because the people that I've brought into my life and empowered with, hey, you, you have control to tell me what I'm doing and, and point out and call out my sin. Um, you have to have that level of trust that they're going to tell you the truth and have my best interest at heart on the other side of this. So this is a, this is a, a tough subject, but I think, I think that there is a process here of, one, um, praying about the fact that, that we have temptation um, and, and seeking... Uh, God's help in being free from that evil that, that, that overcomes us in our life. And I think the process is simply like recognizing that all sin is something that we shouldn't be like so proud of ourselves that we think that we're above it, um, that we own it, that we recognize that our personal sin struggles, that we tell other people because that encourages the body of Christ. And then, of course, recognizing that I'm not by myself, but I'm here with you. All of that stuff is so beneficial when we think about temptation in our lives. And so I hope that this, as we've kind of worked through this difficult passage with you, that these conversations and these thoughts um, are encouraging you and your group. And I just, I just want to ask you as a group, are you the kind of group that can help each other in these difficult situations? Do the people in your group know that you're a person that they can call if they need help? I would love for you guys to have a conversation about that. Um, if you need help uh, working through that, or if you find that you are in temptation and you need to make a plan 
reach out to us. We have lots of resources available to you and we would like to make them available to you. You can reach us by tech, or texting Sea Life Connect to 31996 or emailing us at info at You're not in this by yourself. We're all in this together. We love you guys. We'll see you next time.